Good morning. Welcome to Revolution. My name is Luke. Let's stand together. I'm grateful you guys can join us. Brave the weather. Let's worship together this morning. Lord, we ask you to unite our hearts to serve you and worship you, Father.
Amen. There is another in the fire standing next to you. What an encouraging song this morning that he is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. I want to read from Romans chapter 15, verse 4 through 6 this morning. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. He says, for everything that was written in the past, it was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one heart and with one mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time you have given us this morning to come together, to gather in your presence to be united in one voice and in one spirit under heaven and we call upon the name of Jesus this morning uh, to redeem us from our sins to place all of our hope and trust in him and him alone thank you God I pray that you encourage us through your word this morning through our worship and through our prayers that go heavenward be with us here in this place as we give this remainder of the service to you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please remember to keep the missionaries we support in your prayers. This is TJ Heights. He's a missionary with Mission of Hope. This is Jeremiah and April Markley, along with their kids, Jordan, Sarah, Judah, and Elena. They are missionaries with Ethnos 360 in Papua New Guinea. Well, good morning again. Pulling double duty this morning. Uh, Pastor Josh and I, you know, obviously you know, uh, we alternate some of these responsibilities here. And I would just uh, remind you to be in prayer for him and their family this morning as they are traveling to Wisconsin. So they picked a wonderful day to uh, leave and head north. Uh, I mean, in a van with, how many, is there eight, nine? How many do they have? Um, so be, be in prayer for them as they travel. He has to be in Wisconsin this week and needed to leave today. And I, uh, I do believe they'll be back with us next, next Sunday. So um, I, hope, I hope everyone did have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Um, a time to celebrate with family and friends, come around the table, take an opportunity, you know, this time of year to just be thankful for all that God has uh, provided for you, has blessed you with. Uh, and that does come in, um, in the form of relationships. God blesses us and encourages us through relationships. We'll see a little bit of that in our text today and, and through next week. And so I, I pray that you were very thankful for all that the Lord has done and and that this morning you have also come into this place uh, with a heart of repentance for the three slices or four of pie over multiple days, um, whatever you chose to indulge in, uh, it is gluttony, uh, but sometimes uh, somehow we give that a pass, right? As Miss Charlie gave me a Five Guys gift card out in the lobby, and I'm thinking, okay, just stuffing my face this whole, this whole weekend, so... Um, somehow Thanksgiving, truly being thankful, um, Thanksgiving is synonymous with just being full, so hopefully we've all repented and we are in a place of uh, forgiveness this morning. Enough of that, enough of that. On to Christmas, right? It just keeps, keeps going. Um, but, but I mentioned that just to kind of segue into what we'll be talking about a little bit this morning, and I, and I did read a little bit over the break, and the songs that we sang were... Uh, again, very encouraging, and it, and it is this topic of encouragement that I want to speak to you on uh, today, uh, because especially around this time of year, there are many people who come together, it's very cheerful, it is a very happy time of year, it's, it's, we are gathering together, uh, and a lot of people enjoy this time of year, but there are, there are many people who find this time of year to be rather lonely. Um, sometimes they have lost a loved one around this time of year. Uh, with the weather that's upon us, with the lack of sunlight, with the financial stress, things just kind of happen this time of year uh, that can make it somewhat lonely and discouraging for many people. 
And all of these things can weigh on someone. A friend of mine, he messaged me recently, and he had, uh, it was last week, or it was just a week before Thanksgiving, and he just texted me and he said, you know, could you just pray for me? It's, I've had some bills kind of pile up. I think we'll, we'll be fine. Uh, but there was a major house repair that came on them. Uh, and then the truck broke down, so they had the truck repair. So they had just some financial issues there. And then they've got the burden of Christmas upon them. And there's just that stress. And then he's a little slower in work this time of year. So he, said, he just said, pray for me, which is fine. He wasn't complaining. Uh, he understands that God is sovereign and takes care of him through every trial and tribulation. Uh, but he said, pray for me. He said, and the, but he said, I'm just a bit discouraged. I'm just, a, I'm just a little discouraged. So how do you respond to that? Um, there are many ways that the world will re- respond to encouragement. Uh, they'll give you a bunch of self-help things to do to respond or to deal with being discouraged and how to try and get encouraged. It could be go to the gym, you know, have a plan, uh, change your goals, you know, that kind of stuff. And I thought about when he said that, uh, sent that text to me, I'm just a bit discouraged, how could I be a source of encouragement? And so I, I, he's a little older than I am, and I knew the era that which he grew up in, and some of the songs he likes, which uh, one of them is uh, this hymn that often he will, he, will, he will just mention. And so I just sent him these lyrics to, to a hymn that I know he likes. And, and, and it was this. I, I just texted him back, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And a few minutes went by, and he just said with tears streaming down my face, thank you, thank you. Just an encouraging word pointing him to Christ, back to the Lord. You see, what, what happens when we are discouraged is we have to look to God in those moments when we are discouraged. Go to God and know that he is a source of all encouragement. And so I pray that the Lord uses this time of year Uh, for you to really be aware of what people are going through to help kind of see past all of the holiday cheer, uh, find the ones that are lonely or perhaps discouraged, and be a source of encouragement for them. Always point them to the Christ. And this is what we'll see appear or happen with our text over the next two weeks. We're going to see the Lord encouraging Paul as he comes into the city of Corinth. And he's going to do so initially through a source of friendship. New and old friends will come and encourage Paul. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 18. And I've entitled this message, Encouragement in Corinth. Encouragement in Corinth. Acts chapter 18, verse 1 through 10, Paul, he leaves Athens. He comes into the city of Corinth and he finds a Jew named Aquila, who was a native of Pontus. They recently had come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews were to leave Rome. And so he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade, or leather workers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and he went to a house, went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, he believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Don't be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. The Apostle Paul, he had come from Philippi, he had come through Thessalonica and Berea, where some people responded to the gospel messages, churches were formed in those towns, and Things looked very promising for the Apostle Paul and his ministry, but, but what had also occurred in each of those places is Paul was chased out by angry mobs. He then comes into Athens, and he leaves the city of Athens with very little fruit to show from his visit, as we've been talking about the last two or three weeks, that he had preached this wonderful sermon there on Mars Hill, on the Areopagus, and he had preached in front of many of the great philosophers and the intellectual minds. 
And at the end of chapter 17 that you went through last week, it said that only a few believed and joined him. And so by the time the Apostle Paul gets to the city of Corinth, he has been beaten at times, he has been imprisoned, and he has been run out of cities as he enters the city of Corinth. And so he does so, I think, a little bit discouraged. The reason I say he was discouraged when he comes into Corinth is because he actually writes this to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. When he's writing back to the Corinthian church, he tells them how he came to them. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. This is the Apostle Paul. Weakness, fear, and much trembling. That's how he arrives into the city of Corinth, very discouraged. And it isn't to say that Paul had, didn't have success along the way. He had much success. He had many victories. But again, the, the church had been birthed in Philippi and in Thessalonica there, and God had used Paul mightily in his missionary efforts, but he was still facing persecution and suffering at times, and leaving that city of Athens with very little converts weighed on Paul. If you don't think that dedicating your whole life to ministering and serving the Lord can be at times discouraging, you're wrong because ministering to people can be very discouraging at times. It's a heavy burden that someone like Paul would have borne. The responsibility of spiritually caring for new believers amidst the trials and the persecutions that Christians face is a heavy burden for people to bear. You may encounter one success after another, one victory after victory, but discouragement is not detoured by what occurred yesterday. Discouragement can come upon you in an instant, in a moment. It seeks to rob you of joy, and it seeks, seeks to keep you isolated and unmotivated. If you've ever lost confidence, lost confidence in something or someone, if you've ever lacked enthusiasm, if you've ever become disheartened, then you need to understand that discouragement is that emotion that everyone experiences at one time or another. Even the greatest heroes of the faith, they had moments of being discouraged. We can look to the scriptures, not just the Apostle Paul, but we can look to Numbers chapter 11, verse 11 through 15, where Moses is speaking over the people of Israel. They're hungry and they're looking for food there in the wilderness. And Moses says to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight? You lay the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all of them? Did I give them birth that you should come to me and say, carry them in your bosom, bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give your fathers? Where am I to get meat for them? They weep before me. Give us meat so that we can eat. He says, I'm not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, he says, just kill me at once. If I found favor in your sight, that I might not see my own wretchedness. Moses was discouraged. Joshua, we see in Joshua 7, verse, chapter 7, verse 7, he was discouraged when the Israelites defeated the Amorites. Joshua says to the Lord, Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over to the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites just to destroy us? We would have done well just to stay back across the Jordan and dwell there. The prophet Elijah, after he has this wonderful success, this wonderful victory against the prophets of Baal on the mountain where fire comes down and, and consumes the altar, the prophet Elijah then flees from Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. And it says that he went on this day's journey into the wilderness and he came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die. So discouraged, just, just take my life, Lord. It's enough, he says. For I am no better than my father's. We all know the story of Job. He was so discouraged, he curses the day of his birth. Jeremiah, who we've spoken about the last few weeks, is the weeping prophet. He wrote a book called Lamentations, which actually means weeping or mourning. So you're not any less Christian if you are discouraged. You might even say that it could be a badge of Christianity to be discouraged. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says, what about the Lord? He says about the Lord himself, Isaiah 53, 3, that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. You see, discouragement reveals within us our very own weakness. And it is then in our weakness that he is made strong. When we are discouraged, it is our God who encourages us. And so you're not any less Christian just because you have moments of discouragement. 
The Apostle Paul, he based upon his own admission to the Corinthians, he came to them weak, fearful, and trembling. Again, this was a man who had just spoken on Mars Hill, the Areopagus. He had spoken in front of the Council of Athens where all the intellectual and philosophical minds had gathered. And they gathered there to hear Paul speak to them, to speak about Jesus nonetheless. And yet Paul leaves there after being able to testify about Jesus Christ. He was able to share the gospel with them. And he wasn't beaten for it. He wasn't in prison. Nothing had happened to him. He wasn't thrown in jail. And yet he still arrives in Corinth discouraged. I asked myself, why? Why would he come into Corinth discouraged? I think part of the reason he was discouraged is because there in Athens he came to realize that all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, all of the philosophical reasoning of the world could not bring people to Christ. That only God could bring people to him. And so when he enters Corinth, he is keenly aware of how insufficient he is. And so he comes to them in humility, understanding that he is weak, he is fearful, and that no amount of lofty speech could save sinners. And so he comes into Corinth with nothing else but preaching Christ crucified. Matthew Henry's commentary writes this about salvation and how it's not our job to save people. Matthew Henry writes, When nothing but Christ crucified is plainly preached, the success must be entirely from divine power accompanying the word. And thus men are brought to believe to the salvation of their souls. It didn't matter how eloquent or intellectual Paul appeared to be on Mars Hill in giving the philosophers an explanation of their unknown God that they had there and Paul revealing that to be Jesus. While everything he said was true, it didn't matter unless divine power converted their hearts along with their minds, making them a new creation. You may have heard of the book, A Tale of Two Cities, where uh, Charles Dickens writes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, applicable to Athens, and it was the age of foolishness, applicable to here in Corinth. Describes Paul's journey between Athens and Corinth. It was truly a tale of two cities. Athens, again, was that city that prided themselves in wisdom and philosophy, and Corinth was a city that prided themselves in everything else that was associated, associated with fleshly, foolish behavior. The downfall in Athens was a corruption of the mind, pride, intellect. Corinth's downfall was a corruption of the flesh, vanity, promiscuity, sexual immorality. And so this morning, before we really jump into the text, which I think due to our time we'll probably get into next week, I, I want to take a look at the city itself, the city of Corinth itself. I think it will help us to fully appreciate just what Paul is dealing with when he comes into the city of Corinth, what he is seeing and experiencing, and we'll begin to better understand why he was perhaps so discouraged and why he came to them weak and in fear. Again, he leaves this, this high society of Athens with not much fruit, having seen somewhat of a cold reception from them. He then enters the city of Corinth, which was a nightmare missionary itinerary from the beginning, just from a preparation standpoint. It would have been as if we would have sent Pastor Josh to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. to present the gospel in front of all the senators and committee members there, and then the next day sent him to Vegas or Sin City to present the gospel there on the streets of Vegas. That's the, that's the world they are deal, that Paul is dealing with with regards to Athens and Corinth. Two very different worlds. We get a glimpse into the culture and the practices of the Corinthians when we read the book of Romans. You see, Paul had written... To the Roman church, he had, he had written the book of Romans while he was on his third visit to Corinth. And so he's there in Corinth writing to the Roman church from that perspective of what he's experiencing with, in regards to the Corinthian people. And so he writes this, right in the first chapter of Romans at the end, verse 24 through 32. Again, Paul there in Corinth writing to Rome saying, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. He says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, 
For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not fit, see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know, though they know God's righteous decree that that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and from the context of what he is seeing and experiencing in the city of Corinth. Not only is this kind of evil going on in Corinth, but he is warning against the people who give approval to such practices. And so what you'll find when you read the letters to the Corinthian church, it's a result of the church being influenced by the culture. By the time you get to 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to hold them accountable to the practices that are going on within the church body, that the world has bled over into the church. It's going on in the fellowship of believers. The church opening its doors to be influenced by the culture instead of the other way around. And so the church in Corinth becomes this very messed up church even after Paul leaves them. There were believers there in Corinth. We know that from his letters. There was fruit from Paul's ministry. We see the believers coming to Christ and being baptized there in verse 8. They are believers, but they are spiritually immature at best. And they had allowed the worldly environment in Corinth to take over that things that were acceptable and practiced in their culture, they had allowed to come into the church body and they were people there applauding it. We see an example of this behavior in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in which a son is having a sexual relationship with his father's wife and, and hopefully it's meeting his stepmother as if that would make it any less vile. But we're not sure either way. We just know that a, a son and his, and his father's wife are engaged in sexual morality and the church is like, applauding it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 2, Paul writes back to the church in Corinth there and says it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and he says it's of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and he says, you're arrogant, you're, you're boasting about this. Ought you not rather to mourn? He says, let him who has done this be removed from you. Not only is there a sin of sexual morality going on, but he says the pagans don't even tolerate or practice this. And and he says, not only that, but you're bragging about it. And so he goes on to instruct them to throw this man out of the church, to detach from him, to deliver him over, as you would read on, deliver him over to Satan, his body, so that his flesh may be destroyed, but in the hopes that his spirit would be saved. He goes on in 1 Corinthians verse 9 through 12 of chapter 5. He says, I wrote to you in that letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not all the meaning, the, the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since you would have to go out of this world. But he says, now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. He says, if he's bearing the name of brother, if he's a Christian and if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or a swindler, He says, don't even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders, Paul says? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? So judge him, he says. Judge his actions. If he claims to be a Christian, then rightfully judge the sin and purge him if he will not repent. He goes on in chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 to say, Do you not know that the unrighteous system will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And so here we have, in just these first two chapters, we have this characterization of the Corinthian culture. And to a larger extent, it's the practices and the pursuits, really, of the world. And that the world will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul goes on in verse 11, and he says, but this was you, this was you, 
You were the world, but now you have been saved. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. You were washed and you were sanctified. In verse 13, Paul goes on to make a little comment there about our Thanksgiving holiday, about food being for the body. It's really a warning against gluttonous behavior, but it's being practiced there in the city of Corinth in verse 13. It's food is meant for the stomach, stomach is for the food, and God will destroy both. Then in verse 15, he goes on to tell the church to stop uniting themselves with prostitutes. They were actually uh, uh, um, being persuaded by these temple prostitutes that would come down to the city. There was a, a temple there dedicated to this mythical goddess of Aphrodite in the city of Corinth, which employed more than a thousand temple prostitutes, and they would come down into the city and ply their trade, and the the church was taking part in this. And so in verse 15, he says, will you take your body in which the Spirit of God dwells and join it to a prostitute? Never. In chapter 7, verse 2, we're dealing with fornication. We're just dealing with any sexual relationship outside of the covenant of marriage in verse 2. And Paul says, because of that temptation of sexual immorality, Each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. When couples come to my wife and I for premarital counseling, and they say that they're living together, which, of course, the assumption is that they are sleeping together, I would like to recite to them chapter 10, verse 8, that says 23,000 of them fell in a single day. My wife, on the other hand, being the better half, you know, reels me back from that and says, you you know, you've got to take it a little easier on individuals. But that's the repercussions of fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. We must not indulge in any sexual immorality as some of them did when 23,000 fell in a single day. What Paul's doing is he's showing the gravity of the sin nature, and especially fornication here, by calling them to remember the behavior of the Israelites in the book of Exodus when the Lord dealt with that sin through death. Ultimately, all the sinful practices that are now showing up in the church in Corinth, they are nothing short of offering sacrifices to demons, Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, he says, Now I imply that what the pagans sacrifice, they offer demons and they not to God. And he says, I do not want you to be a participant with demons. What he's saying is that if sin is allowed to remain, if it's allowed to be practiced to go unchecked within the church... It is as if when we come together, we are offering our worship to demons. We turn a blind eye. See, First and Second Corinthians, those letters are letters of correction to a church. Second Corinthians verse, chapter two, verse one, Paul will write that these are actually letters, or, or these times he visits them are actually painful visits, tear-filled letters to a very messed up church, and he offers a loving but yet a harsh reprimand to them through those letters. Stop doing what you're doing, stop practicing what you're practicing, and don't allow these things to happen when you gather together. Do not offer your worship to demons. Just reading through a few of the many verses from the book of Corinthians, it it gives us an idea of the culture that Paul stepped into when he first came to the city of Corinth. And mind you, he comes into Corinth alone. We can have a better understanding of why maybe Paul was so discouraged. But he was there in this city of fornication and all of these vile things that this city was involved in. And he's there alone and discouraged. Even though we may be discouraged our time, again, at times, our, again, our God is a God of encouragement and He is a God of comfort, and when you are discouraged, when you are depressed, when you are anxious, when you are lonely, we can take comfort in the Lord's promises that He will be the one that comforts us. Even though Paul's visit here to the Corinthians is painful and it is tearful, the encouraging part to them comes in his second letter to them when he writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 through 4. He says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those 
who are in any, in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. When Jesus spoke to the apostles about leaving them, about going to the cross, that he would no longer be with them, he could sense their worry. As we walked through the Gospel of John over a couple of years, we, we saw the apostles' reaction when they found out the Lord would have to leave them. And yet Jesus turns to them in John chapter 14, verse 1, and says what? Let not your hearts be troubled. He is a God of comfort, and your discouragement can quickly be turned around when you lean into the promises of God. We know He's a God of comfort because we've seen it all through the text. Again, in the Gospel of John, Jesus wept there at the tomb of Lazarus, having compassion over him. He had compassion when Mary came to him about her brother Lazarus, when, when she came to, anguish, when it came to him in anguish. The Lord told the apostles that their sorrow would be turned to joy and to take heart, for it was he who had overcome the world. So everything in the world that could come against us to discourage us, the Lord has overcome. We can take comfort in the words of Isaiah in times of discouragement, for Isaiah says this about the Lord to his people in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 through 3. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name, he says. You are mine. We sang this morning, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. For what? I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Your Savior. It was so encouraging to us this morning that the Lord doesn't change. There is a penalty for for sin, and there is judgment coming. But the Lord is faithful to comfort those who will believe and trust in Him, and He will forgive you and rescue you, rescue you in the day of judgment. He doesn't change. He encouraged and comforted His people in the days of Isaiah, and He brings encouragement and comfort to His people today. He brings us comfort by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Acts chapter 9, verse 31 says, The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They walked in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit resides in you this morning. That you have believed, if you have believed in Jesus Christ to redeem you from your sins, whatever they may be, past, present, and future, you can have the comfort of the Holy Spirit this morning. If you have trusted in Him, you can be encouraged in the Lord and and be thankful that He will never leave you or forsake you, especially when we are discouraged. The Lord comforts Paul as he ministers to the Corinthians, and he's going to do so by means of friendship, the conversion of new believers, and ultimately, he will encourage Paul with his very own presence, but more on that next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for encouraging us through your word and by the power of your Spirit this morning. You have given us a wonderful gift in sending your Son Jesus to us. And I pray that people would have the faith to believe upon the cross and upon the sacrifice of Jesus. That His blood was shed for us. I pray, Lord, that they would be forever thankful for the wonderful gift of salvation that you have so graciously given to those who would come to you in repentance. You are faithful to forgive us our sins for all who call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I pray, Lord, that you would protect this church against any worldly influences, that we would be found not guilty in offering any type of worship to demons, Lord, but instead we would be counted as 
faithful for worshiping in spirit and in truth. So Lord, I pray this morning that our time together has been glorifying to you and that we would continue to preach Christ crucified in all of our weakness and fear and trembling to anyone that you send our way. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me and let's worship the Lord one more time through song as we close our service. I confess
Aren't we grateful for that this morning? We're so grateful you could join us. We hope you have a safe trip home and a great week. We'll see you next Sunday at 9.30. We'll see you.